Hey guys, how you doing? Welcome back to another episode of the Hemmings Hot Rod Barbecue. So this is a special episode. Not that the other ones aren't, but this one we're going to be talking about EVs with our friend John Volker. Now, this is a gentleman that he edited Green Car Reports for nine years, so well versed in EV, and he has the, the ability to dispel a lot of the myths about what EVs are when we talk about range, when we talk about charging, when we talk about the future of them and where they're going. So might not be exactly what you're used to, but give it a listen because this was a really, really fun episode and John is simply amazing. Now, in honor of him, as you all know, we always pull a car from our Hemmings classifieds of which we have 25 to 30,000 online classifieds um, as well as our Hemmings auctions. But for this one, I found something that was really cool in the form of a 1921 Detroit Electric. That's right, a 1921 Detroit Electric. That is an all-electric car made 100 years ago. So for those of you who think that EVs are something that are relatively new, think again, because the tech was out there at the same time that you had to crank the old handle on the Model T and get that thing rolling. So... We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in about three or four seconds with John. So uh, stay tuned for a very electrified episode of the podcast. Hey, everyone, and welcome back with Mr. John Volkel. Now, for those who don't know, John is an EV expert. Man knows more about EVs than I'll ever know and that most people have well forgotten. So, John... Thank you for coming on and uh, welcome to the Hot Rod Barbecue. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. All right. So let's talk about EVs because most people that watch this show, you are our first dedicated EV guest on the barbecue. Now they made you, huh? Well, no, they didn't. This was this no, was no, a no, good you one you because gotta have, you gotta have hit that that guy. This well, this is good because. I mean, I, I own seven cars, none of which get over, I think my best MPG is maybe 17 miles to the gallon, and my worst is six, right? I am I am a fan, and most people think I hate EVs. That is absolutely not the case. I just don't have as much experience with them. So this mm -hmm. is going to be a very educational process for me, so I'm actually very excited about this. Cool. And that's what's interesting to me is I've been doing this since mm, 2005, 2007. Mm -hmm. Over that time, we have gone from um, EVs being considered something that's beneath contempt, electric, you know, fancy golf mm -hmm. carts and suitable in the um, immortal words of one of our friends who shall go nameless, really only something that for smelly hippies. And um, <laughs> true quote. And now people are like, oh, well, they're really fast, but I'm sure they still wouldn't work for me. They're great fun to drive. Mm -hmm. And that's, we're at an interesting point right now. That's really going to change. Um, but one of the things about EVs that interests me, if you look at the history of automobiles, everything came in at the top end, right? Mm -hmm. Think about what made gasoline dominant. It was the electric self-starter, Charles Kettering, took a battery, your basic 12 volt starter battery, hasn't changed a lot in 130 years, put a little electric motor with it. And all of a sudden your car didn't necessarily run the risk of breaking your arm when you got it started. That was what gave, made mm -hmm. gasoline dominant in the 20th century, right? And so electricity, yay. But then, well, go ahead. No, I think it's interesting because I mean, when, when you think about it and, you know, gas cars have been around for, for a long time. And it's, it's, it's interesting for this podcast at, at the beginning of every show, we actually look through our Hemi's classifieds and we pull a car and I was right. actually right. able to find a 1921 Detroit electric. Oh, so wow. yeah. you're, you're talking about, I mean, 21, that's a hundred years ago, yeah. right? So well, e EVs are not new. The concept is not new. And in 1900, a third of the market was EVs, a third of the market was steam, and a third of the market was gasoline. Now, gasoline had range because gasoline is a wonderful substance. You know, carry a gallon of it around that, mm -hmm. you know, weighs about eight pounds. That'll take you 25 miles. That's sure. an amazing thing compared to the amount of batteries. But the cars were incredibly noisy. 
they blew up occasionally. Mm-hmm. They could break your arm starting them, which really was a problem. Um, steam cars were great. They were smooth. They were powerful. They just took 45 minutes to get started. That's kind of a problem. And electric cars were smoothest, calmest, most civilized, suitable for women, as they said at the time. And I have the ads to prove it. Um, <laughs> but they tended to top out on range, as cars do today. And the problem was to carry enough batteries to go a long way would be thousands of pounds of lead acid right. batteries. And right. so they kind of died away after gasoline took off. Steam cars died away. And we, this was really the gasoline century. But what, what I was going about with Kettering was that came in at the top of the market. That came in at a Cadillac. Think about automatic transmissions. Think about air conditioning, disc brakes. Mm-hmm. Sure. What else? Turbochargers, fuel injection. It all comes in either in racing or in luxury. And eventually automotive engineers are really good at making stuff cheaper, smaller, and more mm-hmm. reliable. And it filters down. Electric cars didn't do that. If you think about the Nissan Leaf, that was supposed to be a mass market car. It was small, wasn't Mm -hmm. incredibly fast, wasn't incredibly luxurious. If you will forgive me, I think it didn't look incredibly compelling. Um, It was terrible. It looked looked like a frog. You could say it. Um, Yeah, yeah. it was terrible. So um, Tesla did the automotive innovation thing the traditional way that it has worked for a hundred years, which was, I don't know if it was a shock to GM and to Nissan, but Tesla has been following the model that a lot of innovators have followed in uh, the auto industry. And they made a car that was compelling on its own merits and it was electric. You know, a Model S so, looked amazing. It was incredibly fast. Yeah. Yep. So, so when you first started in this, what, what initially drew you to EVs? Because... I know for me, and I, and I was one of those skeptics. I mean, I had done, and this goes back to, I want to say 2008 or so. I, I was part of a panel discussion for BMW, and they had this series years ago called um, Activate the Future. And, I remember that, and, yeah. Yeah. So, year, and I was the editor of another automotive website back then, and they had asked me to come on as as kind of the the V8 muscle car guy, so to speak, right? And you know, it was interesting because at the time they BMW was doing the E the E Mini. Um, Tesla really wasn't there yet. Um, and it was a contrast from there to now. We're talking, uh, you know, maybe 12 years ago has been massive. The you know, the the evolution of the electric car has been massive to where it started off as somewhat of a gimmick. Not I don't want to say a gimmick, but it started off as, as kind of a this limited technology, work. limited I mean, technology. Yeah. What you could do at the time, there were obviously Absolutely. limits. Yeah. Yeah. To, to now where we know that, okay, the technology is not only viable, but it's been proven. But I think people are, there's still a lot of folks out there that are still a bit trepidatious on, should I go out and spend the money? Is it going to last me? And so on and so forth. But what initially drew you to the EV side of the industry? <sighs> Um, it's an interesting question. I'm not sure I really know the answer, but part of it was tactical. Um, I have done a bunch of things during my so-called career. Mm-hmm. Um, I have an engineering degree. It's probably better for the world. No one ever paid me to engineer anything, but, okay. <laughs> um, it, uh, I bounced around. I did a bunch of magazines. I got into the internet. I was a managing editor, a bunch of titles, not mm-hmm. automotive, I should say. I covered science and small computers in the 80s. And for a variety of career reasons in 2005, uh, the only time in my career I've been canned outright, um, everybody should be canned once. Um, Absolutely. Glucker's been canned twice. That's different. But um, (laughs) so um, I, I sort of took some time off to lick my wounds, figure out what I wanted to do. I had been doing a little bit of automotive writing on the side. And I thought, okay. At that age, um, if I don't do it now, I will never do it. So um, I have a little bit of money. I'm going to become an automotive journalist. Idiotic thing to do in your mid 40s. No, I I did the same thing. So I I changed career. Oh, yeah. I started. I was a web designer. I was a web designer um, for Citibank for 12 years. And then I, I quit my job, flat out quit in 2008 
because I uh, wanted to play with cars. And I went yeah. from making a bunch of money to no money. Yeah. And you just, you figure it out and you just, you, you know, you jump in with both feet and you hope that you have some talent as a writer or as a host or whatever the case is. And it, it was a massive leap of faith, but I was in the same boat where if I don't do it now, it's not going to happen. Yeah. And totally, it, totally there. And mm -hmm. so um, I was lucky enough at that point living in New York that I had got an apartment when New York was cheap and dirty and really, really dangerous, which is cheaper. Yep. Um, I was there. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't recognize my neighborhood anymore, but um, I sort of thought around, it's like, okay, I'm not a race driver. Um, you know, I can't talk Ferrari. It, it's heresy, but Ferraris actually kind of bore me. There are lots of them. They are all red and they sound great. Um, but in the end, it's not germane to how the auto industry is going to change. And we're in this sure. very fascinating period for the rest of my life where there'll be stuff for me to write about. So sure. I thought, okay, 2005, what niche can I hit? And the whole, I hate the, the phrase green cars, but it's the sort of least worst phrase, you know, sure. fuel economy, fuel efficiency, advanced engineering, and increasingly electrification, which then meant hybrids. Um, and I, I got a huge lucky break. Marty Padgett hired me to be the founding managing sure. editor of Green Car Reports, February 2009. Yeah, 2009. Um, cranking out articles. Glucker talked about $20 a post. Mm -hmm. In the nine years I ran that site, I did become an employee. I wrote 4,600 articles and edited about 7,000 more. Yep. So I, it's great training. I'm like a city desk guy now. Oh, yeah. But the point was no one was doing it because electric cars were for smelly hippies. Priuses were for annoying people who were virtue signaling and pip, 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 pip. Yeah. Um, and so actually the idea that someone could write, I hope intelligently about those things, no one was doing it. And right. there's a, there's a photo of like the green car mafia, I was told, um, where four of us are at a conference and there would be the same four of us, right? Right. You of know, course. We show up at every conference. Um, and over time that worked, the search terms for green car reports when I started were Prius and hybrid. And when we ended, they were electric car and Tesla. So it was right. an interesting, you know, um, evolution. Yeah. And it, I sort of snuck backwards into being a little bit of an analyst of the industry, just because the people who cover the whole industry, electric cars were still such a small part of the deal that, um, they would cover them. They'd hit the press releases and try to add some context. And that was it. Yep. And so being able to say, yeah, but okay, that one's not important. This one's important. And here's why. And yeah. this battery is important, but what they're overlooking is this charging system. It gets, it gets nerdy and granular pretty quick, but it's important stuff to know for journalists. So that's what yeah. I do. And I, I'll tell you, I, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, I know that when I first started, I mean, just because EVs of what I, of the, the concentration that I was in, which was just kind of muscle car and horsepower and stuff like that, it was, it was interesting. It was kind of like that shiny new thing that was on the shelf, but it wasn't ready for prime time yet. Right. And, and to your point, until Tesla came out, that's when the mark was made. That's when all of a sudden you're like, it goes zero to 60 and you know, like the, the, you know, the P75 or whatever in three and a half seconds or four seconds. And everybody was like, holy shit, that's like M5 fast. So then I think it started to hit home with a lot of people. And, you know, you still have a, a vast majority of people that aren't that comfortable with it yet because they don't have an experience with, with an electric car. Hybrids, hybrids were a great stepping stone to a full EV for so many mm -hmm. people because it still gave them that comfort level of, well, it still has a gas engine, so even if the battery's dead, I'll be fine, right? We think of them as the gateway drug. Absolutely. It's, it is the marijuana of automobiles, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and, and that goes with myself included. I think it's, it's very easy for people to understand the way a hybrid works, right? Electric motor, gas motor, they work together. You could plug them in, you could charge them, and they'll go. I think you're so. giving the mass market of car buyers possibly more credit or more analytics than they do people get hybrids they're just like regular cars except they're weird looking but magic gerbils under the hood drink a lot less 
Mm -hmm. And yes, people <laughs> get electric cars. It's a car you plug in at night, like right. your phone. Right. As soon as you get into the middle, plug in hybrids. And this has been a wrap of mine for a long time that a lot of people in the industry don't like. But as soon as you get into the middle, and I've talked to people, I've watched salespeople, mm -hmm. plug in hybrids. Okay. So it's a hybrid like a Prius. Well, yes, but you plug it in and you can go electric for a while. And, you know, maybe that's your daily. And they're like, okay, well, how much range does it have? Oh, it has, you know, 28 miles or 52 miles or whatever. And they look at you and they're like, well, why would I want that's an electric enough. car with 52 miles? And you, they're done. That's it. Right. You don't get another chance. It's really hard to explain. Electric cars are inherently understandable. It's just that most people don't have the experience. They've never driven one. Mm -hmm. And because they're used to putting gas in without even thinking about their car, the whole mo notion that you plug in at home overnight just doesn't register. That, that's actually a great, great point. Um, and I think you're, you're dead on with that because it's, yeah, I, I feel like it, it is either one of the other to, uh, to a, a certain perspective, right? It's, you know, hybrid is hybrid. I get that electric is electric, but if I have to plug it in, I'm kind of confused right now. Right. You know? And you don't see people converting old cars to be plug-in hybrids. No. There no. is the guy with the 46 Dodge truck who put a Prius underneath, which I always there, love just because it was so freaking weird. You know, it's it's interesting. I mean, GM has, they're, they're working with Lingfelter right now to do their kind of crate EV swap yeah. kit. And as for me, like I can see it in some, you know, instances, but I get a lot of DMs and a lot of emails about, hey, would you ever think about putting an EV motor in a Camaro? And I'm like, no, not at all. Unless for me, if the car was... If it's like a Volkswagen bus or something that was so underpowered, then yes, right. I could see it. I could see the appeal to it. It makes sense. But when you're doing conversions on something where the heart and the soul lies under that hood, mm -hmm. no, I have, I do have an issue with that. I, well, and I heard you and Jeff discussing this. Yeah. I have thoughts. Um, <laughs> so I get the point, you know, you are not going to take electric Ferraris are going to be few and far between um, because a Ferrari is about an engine. I, mm -hmm. uh, somebody said Alpha, same thing. Get that. Sure. Um, what you said is very North American point of view, though. What I'm seeing Absolutely. in Europe um, is that a lot of people want to drive older cars, but because of the current or coming uh, emissions cordons, they want to be able to drive electric within the city. And um, the only way they can do that, either affordably or at all in the future, is to have an electric car. And yes, you can have an electric Renault Zoe if you want, but mm -hmm. everybody, including your secretary, has that. And if you're the guy in the corner office, you want something a bit more special. Sure. So you convert the whatever it is. Um, I really liked Jaguar's approach. They offer, or they are supposed to be offering, I haven't checked back, they offer the ability to make a completely electric E-type mm -hmm. that is completely reversible, they claim. So, you know, store the combustion engine in the corner in a nice climate control box mm -hmm. and drive your E-type into the office and back. Um, it will, of course, outperform a standard E-type by a oh, sure. very great deal. But, um, you know, things like that, I think the question is, I'm still seeing the gap on just on price. Nis dead Nissan Leafs are a great thing to part out sure. for uh, conversions. You know, most people who are going to convert an old car are probably not going to want to do 600 miles in it for the same right. reason you, I mean, the guy who drove the blower Bentley from Seattle to Monterey one year. Mm -hmm. I, Rockstar. I, Rockstar. I have such amazing admiration <laughs> for him. Most people don't want to do that. Um, right. And so, you know, 100 mile, 140 mile range is fine in an old in conversion car. And because the leaf isn't water cooled, there's a little bit less complexity. There are people out there who are making drop in components to get leaf modules. And the problem then just becomes you have to engineer your own uh, containers, mm -hmm. framing. How do you shift the weight within a car? Um, or is it a popular enough car? Let's say, a nerdy secretary version of a 65 Mustang sure. that a kit would make sense. Sure. And so that, I, and I could totally see that. I mean, there is, there is definitely appeals in that direction. 
Um, let me ask you this. So one of the things about EVs right now is the price of them, right? They're right. still relatively high for a full EV. People still getting that range anxiety and so on and so forth. Living in, you know, being growing up in New York City and, and in Brooklyn and then moving out to the West Coast, especially in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area, I feel like every fourth car is an EV, right? It's a Tesla or it's, it's some, you know, it's, it's a GM or whatever the case is, right? There are, it's Prius galore out here. Everybody's got Prius. Right. Um, when it comes to the range of these cars and more importantly, I guess the, the charging facilities, that I know has been an issue. Now, on a day-to-day -day basis, people that have home charging stations, right? It's, it's a non-issue. But I remember, I think it was in November when everybody was, or not this past November, but the previous, um, 2019, everybody, you know, they had massive articles about EV lines were X amount. And sometimes an EV station doesn't work. And, you know, Tesla has a different EV plug-in than Toyota or this or whatever the case is. How come you think that, why do you think that wasn't standardized across the board as far as just making each station work for every single person? Is that because it was still in its infancy or still is in its infancy? Okay, several several things to unpack. A lot, 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 yeah, there's a lot yeah. there. Range. Um, there was a question for a while as to whether 150 miles of range was enough to make people feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, it's not in North America. I, I've come to think 200 is your minimum, but really 250 is, is your practical minimum. Mm -hmm. I think 300 or above miles rated range, people know even if you lose 20% on a cold day and you're running the heat, you're still, um, good. you're still over 200, you're probably good. And that includes yeah. taking the sick kid to the hospital at 2 a.m., even if your car is still plugged in. Um, people think they drive more than they do mile-wise because they spend a lot of time sitting in traffic, but they don't realize that their average speed is like 18 miles an hour. So for North America, the minimum acceptable range is 250 or 300. Batteries have fallen way, way, way quicker than they were ever expected to in 2008, 2010, when they were starting to think about the Volt. Um, you know, historically they fall at 7% a year. They've fallen way quicker over the last decade. Really? And that decline, oh, there's some investment bank, I can never remember which one it is, which is now on its fourth downward revision of battery cost projections. Because, you know, there are people make investments based on, sure. well, and they're, one of the German makes said, well, you know, we see electric cars becoming cost competitive with similar segment cars, basically, with mm -hmm. gasoline engines somewhere between 2030 and 2040. That's going to happen, depending on your tax regime, what gasoline costs, yeah. and all the rest, between 2025 and 2030. Hmm. Um, okay. In part, because battery costs continue to come down from chemistry, better yields from volume, and economies of scale. GM is building a billion dollar battery plant with LG Chem yeah. and um, gasoline engines to meet carbon dioxide reductions in average tailpipe emissions are going to get to the point where your average full-size pickup will be driven by a 1.5 liter three-cylinder engine that's turbocharged and supercharged and puts out 350 horsepower sure. and is driving through a 28-speed transmission. So, you know, the, the the two lines start to cross. That's range and sort of cost. Let's look at um, charging, which is mm -hmm. massively misunderstood. Um, there is a standard charging socket for what we call level two, which is 240 volt charging. It's the lower right. speed kind of mm -hmm. charge. Sure. Every car sold in America, except Tesla, uses that same plug. They had the problem with the California EVs in the late 90s where they all use different charging systems. Putting in public charging makes, you know, that's a real problem. So sure. they're like, let's get together. We'll have a standard plug. Everybody used it, except Elon Musk looked at it and said, that's ugly. I want a better, prettier plug. And so they have a different mm -hmm. plug. Um, High-speed charging is where it gets a little more complicated. Tesla set up what the model should be. You have a nationwide set of high-speed charging stations mm -hmm. so that basically you can drive coast to coast. You stop every so often. Um, in, the, in the case of a Tesla, you stop every 200 miles or so. 
you wait for 20 to 40 minutes, but the car tells you, all right, you're going here. I will drop you there with 25% range in your battery, but I'm only going to tell you to charge for 22 minutes here because you'll charge more at the next station or something. Gotcha. The car really optimizes all that stuff. And that's standard right. now, but that was radical in 2012. Sure. sure. Um, the problem with the rest of it is that there are a whole variety of theoretically for-profit entities, um, EVgo, uh, Electrify America, sure. Green Lots, et cetera, um, that have been funded based on the idea they're going to make money selling charging to um, drivers, which I have not yet been convinced of. I look forward to seeing that. Mm -hmm. um, but they're all competing with each other, which would be okay in terms of gasoline, except right now, it's a misery for electric car drivers because you have to be a member of all these different networks. At one right. point I carried seven cards or fobs yeah. or phone apps. It's idiotic. That is starting to regularize now. The Ford Mustang okay. Mach-E, you plug it in at certain networks and it simply talks to the back end, talks to the car maker. They say, okay, here's the credit card. It all works fine, which Tesla has been doing since 2012. But in terms of network capacity, 80% of the people who buy, who can afford to buy new cars have off street parking. So all right. of the people who are going to buy new electric cars are going to be charging them at home overnight sure. or in their condos or whatever. Um, on roads, they, we are still building it out and we will need more high speed charging closets. But I hear quite a lot, but the grid. But the grid, right, right, at full tilt, a high-speed electric car charging plaza with say twelve or sixteen slots, and you pull in, you know, twelve or sixteen Tycons, which charge it up to two hundred and seventy kilowatts. At full tilt, that thing runs about as much as a Walmart supercenter, and we just don't hear about Walmart supercenters bringing down the right. grid, right? Sure. So it's a solvable problem, and it is so much easier to do than hydrogen, which is its own topic. And I will bring beer for that. But, um, you know, it's, we will have a charging network. There will be gaps. Um, there are peak usage issues. Those things can be worked out. And the, the metaphor I like to draw is one of my favorite art. You know, when you write that many articles, I have one that's, that was one of my favorites. And it was about range anxiety in gasoline cars in 1910, because we did not have in 1910. Oh, there's no, that's sure. You know, there was no so infrastructure. If you wanted to go visit Aunt Thelma on the farm, 250 miles away, you had to, ahead of time, write a check and get gasoline shipped to the pharmacies en route because pharmacies were the place that held, you know, flammable explosive. Right. Batteries. And they had pumps out front at the curb. And so you would show up in your pre-model T as like, hi, I'm John, you know, you should have 10 gallons of gasoline for me. And then you carry it out, pour it in the pump, pour it in your car and keep going. But you had sure. to arrange all of that ahead of time. So building a nationwide fueling infrastructure takes some time, but it is well underway. Most people don't know we have something like 25,000 high-speed charging cables already. You know what a gas station looks like? No one knows what a charging plaza looks like. Right. In part because, you know, some of the high speed ones and the smaller ones, if you look on the app, it's like drive past the McDonald's, turn right at the blue fence. Right. It's right next to the dumpster. Right. Next to the dumpster will be the title of my book about the history of electric charging. <laughs> so let me ask you. So the, the example that you just gave about right. a full tilt charging station drawing about as much as a Walmart supercenter, Right. That is by far the best example that I have heard about the grid not being intact or not being able to handle it, right? When you consider how many of these mega plazas, meaning you know, Walmarts and everything, or a mall or whatever, or Costco's or whatever the case is, are operating, there is no issue, right? right. The power goes there, it's fine. The lights don't shut off. We're fine. Well, and here's another one. There was a study done about 10 years ago now. If we magically converted two thirds of all the road miles in the US overnight to be electric power. And that's mm -hmm. gonna take decades. You know, We're talking trucks and cars yeah. and everything. 
if two thirds of all of those trillions of miles were run off the grid, it would boost U.S. electric demand seven percent. That's huge. gonna that's gonna be decades. It's right. just not that big a deal. Yeah, and I, I think that's. I mean, again, for me, this is this is all news to me. I, not being an EV guy and not being super educated on it, just because it's generally not something that's in my wheelhouse. Sure. You know, hearing about it from from individuals like yourself, it does open a lot of a lot of doors and it does open your eyes a little bit or a lot, I should say. So going, all right. So now we know that the, the, the infrastructure could basically handle it. We're just, it's still being built. It's still being developed. Yeah. Right. So in California, we have the mandate by 2035, no more petrol driven engines are going to be sold. Right. That's what Newsom. No new vehicles, with, no new vehicles and probably light duty ones, but the regs haven't been written. Yep. So will that, and I don't know if you know this or not, like, does that mean it's only EVs? Does it mean that their hybrids will still be sold? Because I think when people hear that, all of a sudden memes come all over the internet, right? And no new gas engines and the world's going to collapse and all that bullshit that you hear all the time. Um, by that time, and again, that's only 14 years from now. It's not, not far. It's a blink, really. Um, do you think that the general public... Will or do you think there'll be an EV that's that's affordable for the general public? Meaning that I want to say thirty five thousand four. Well, what the hell am I talking about? I mean, the average price of a new car is probably forty thousand dollars now. I think it's thirty seven or yeah. something like that. So, where do you think we'll be in that time, from a a charging perspective, from a range perspective? Oh. Um, I feel compelled to start by telling my friend Jim in Pomona. I promise you, I know you don't believe me, but I promise you, the government is not going to come. You know, California state is not going to come break into your garage and crush your GTO on your lawn. I promise. No. All right. Um, to think about where we'll be 15 years from now, let's look at the last 10 years, because it's just 10 years since the first modern electric cars yeah. went on sale. Okay, Tesla Roadster, but that was six years. Right. Leaf and Volt. The Leaf had 73 miles of range and fast charging for a Leaf was 50 kilowatts. Okay. And it cost $34,000, something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it was a C-segment hatchback, which only a certain subset of America mm -hmm. wants to buy anyway. Fast forward. Now, Nissan is about to introduce a 300 mile compact crossover, which people want. It's a, still a hatchback, but it's called an SUV now. Sure. Um, the fast charging will be up to 150 kilowatts, three times as fast. Mm -hmm. um, and it will have uh, four times the range. And it won't lose them any more money, and it will probably make money over the course of its lifespan, as the LEAF did just 10 years ago. Sure. So fast forward that to 10 years in the future, 2031. Um, mm -hmm. I expect there to be $25,000 electric cars with 250 miles of range in a variety of segments, maybe sedans and hatches because they're easier, um, especially from the Koreans who looked at Detroit getting out of passenger cars and said, ooh, mm -hmm. good, we like right. that. Um, and I expect there will be a nationwide charging network that's not necessarily friction free, but works a hell of a lot better than it does today. Okay. And it will be simply less weird or adventurous or worthy mm. of comment for someone to have an electric car and a gasoline car in the fleet, but be thinking electric for the new one. Now, if you're somebody in Texas who commutes single occupancy in a 3,500 heavy duty pickup. Sure. You may take a while longer, um, right. you know, I, and I, I, you know, Tim Esterdahl, um, mm -hmm. I went on pickup truck talk and we had a great conversation about sure. pickup trucks and electric vehicles that was sort of in this, well, I probably need to know this stuff, even though I don't like it, but we're right. going to have to know it. Um, but, you know, for the vehicles that we commute in, the average American household has two and a half cars, for God's sakes. Yeah. The average wealthy American household, the ones who are buying new cars now, has three point something. You know, one of those being electric, what we have seen in California is that those households start to fight over 
who gets the electric car and right. you know who has to drive the other one so we will see by 2025 really compelling volume segments run off electricity and by 2030 price competitiveness and that same thing where someone got a prius on your cul-de-sac and it looked really weird and people were afraid to get yeah. in and then they're like no it's a real car it does the same stuff right here's how it works right so um i'm very much looking forward to the next 10 or 15 years and even if california doesn't make it a full mandate and to answer your question it may include plug-in hybrids but everything has to sure. have the ability to run zero emissions sure. at some point and maybe fuel cell cars different topic um it's a goal and we need goals and we need time frames Agreed. to give people yeah. a sense of where we're going. So, and I, I agree with that. Absolutely. Let me ask you about the longevity of these cars, right? Okay. Because I'll give you an example. So my, I, I have seven vehicles, my newest okay. vehicle, my daily driver is 19 years old. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, I can work on it. I could fix it. I can, it's, it's got 17 moving parts. Right. It, it, you know, so when we talk about battery evolution and we talk about, you know, me being able to go out and buy a, a 20 year old car to drive every day for another hundred thousand miles. Um, will assuming these, it smogs. Assuming it smogs. Yep. Um, which they do, which is pretty good. Um, will EVs get to that point because right now, again, with the evolution in battery technology, will you be able to buy a 20 or 25 year old EV and will it still be capable of being on the road? And we, will there be aftermarket support and parts and things like that? Or are these cars, do you feel going to be somewhat disposable after 15 years, 20 years? It's an interesting question. I think I can probably argue both sides of it. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is a generation of low range electric cars. You know, um, I'm fond of the iMev, the only Japanese K car that's been sold legit mm -hmm. in America. But, yep. you know, 62 miles on a good day, you know, early leaf, yeah. same things. To some degree, I hate to say throwaway cars, but those are going to have a very limited market as used cars as batteries wane. Once we get to sort of 250 mile cars in volume, yeah. um, the longevity of the battery, which is generally guaranteed against failure for eight or 10 years or mm -hmm. you know, 100 or 150,000 miles, um, the date, we just don't have enough data for me to right. be authoritative in answering, sure. but early data from Model S's, many of which have covered well more than 100,000 miles, seem to indicate that you on average, lose no more than 10% of your range after the first 100,000 miles. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm aware of a 480,000 mile Model I've, S. That yeah, did I've impact, heard about that. Yeah, blow yep. up a battery pack. And yeah. Tesla was sort of, you did what, really? And I right. think they might have made it easy to get a new one. But, um, you know, what's interesting to me is manufacturers starting to think more about this. The GM Ultium battery system which is what's going to go into all of its new EVs, starting with the Hummer and going forward, mm -hmm. has a very interesting feature no one else has ever talked about. Um, it is architected in such a way that if you have a module that goes bad, not the whole battery, just a chunk of the battery, cells are assembled into modules. Mm -hmm. You know, yep. If one module goes bad, you can drop in a new module of a different and improved chemistry and the battery compensates automatically. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I, I was I was actually, are you really saying? They just sort of nodded and smiled slightly. Um, they have thought about this because they're going to have to service these vehicles for a while. Modules will die. Cells will die. Yep, sure. You know, contacts corrode, whatever it may be. They don't want to replace the battery. Right. Um, and so they've started to think about maintenance. What will be interesting, one of the things right now is if you have an old Tesla or a slightly wrecked Tesla, it's probably more economic to yank out the battery and sell the modules to hot rodders than it is to repair the car. Um, right. I'm sort of kind of watching out for a Model S from 2012 within the first five, 7,000 serial yeah. numbers, just mm -hmm. because one day, you know, that'll be the flat floor E-type of the electric sure. car world. And people sure. laugh, but you know, the earliest Leafs had aluminum doors, stuff like that. Right. Um, 
is the leaf market maybe the nash metropolitan market <laughs> well <laughs> um but uh you know i think they will be collectible in a way a battery swap once you get a whole set of shade tree mechanics out there who understand mm -hmm. battery management and yeah. 400 volts yeah is inherently no more complicated than an engine swap yeah if you get people starting to make systems that allow you to interface with the rest of the car and so in the same way that there are kits to drop a chevy you know small block crate sure. motor into a b and c mm -hmm. i wouldn't be surprised to see if there are going to be kits to drop x amount of tesla modules into fill in the blank which is where your chevy yeah. crate motor the electric battery and crate motor came from sure that you know it's interesting that that i can absolutely see and that's one of the things you know being kind of an old hot rodder mm -hmm. and knowing that like i can still get parts for my 50 year old cars because right. the aftermarket is there, right? I could still go out and buy a set of heads or cams and a certain fifty-year-old cars. So I'll tell you a story that gets into my old cars, which is um, two of my old cars are Morris Miners, first British car to make a million. Not the Mini, same guy who designed it, but mm -hmm. the little roundy one that looks yeah. like a small Buick Roadmaster, sure from nineteen forty-eight. Um, because they made so many, and it was kind of Britain's VW Beetle, you can almost not entirely but almost build a brand new morris minor out of the parts yeah. that are still available and you know they sure. made 10 million a series engines i also have a 1991 isuzu impulse wagon back which is my yeah. current you're not favorite. getting parts for that i was shocked there's nothing some of the engine parts are available yeah but it's like you know does anyone have a rock auto code because it's it's that or this it's underground i was shocked and i'm yeah. told that that's all you know a lot of the old um 80s and 90s stuff and it's it's kind of the the rad challenge really is they're complex enough where you can't necessarily do everything i, yeah. I was just I, horrified how hard it is to get parts for a car that's only 30 years old i i went through that with a 928 i i bought an 86 32 valve 928 and it basically did a mechanical restoration on it okay and it was tough it was poor is portion not like mercedes-benz which will sell you anything if you want to sell a child or two they they simply do not have the port parts okay. porsche makes some of the parts but you have to find i mean it, it was the mid-1980s so a lot of the plastic pieces that become super mm -hmm. brittle from back in the day they're just unobtainium unless you find a donor car and things of that nature um you know that that engine was basically two 944 motors that was slapped together so you find a good mechanic and you can make it work type of thing um but yeah some of the obscure cars especially when you're talking about things like an isuzu or something like that um those are tough whereas if you're talking about like my daily is a 96 ford bronco right yeah. i can i can literally get every single part for that vehicle on rock auto because it's from the cab forward, it's an F-150 and they made 9 billion of those things. So it's easy, right? So I, to your point, I, I absolutely agree. I think that the more obscure cars will be very difficult to get. Um, but I, I always kind of wondered that as, as somebody who keeps cars for a long time, those that go out and keep cars for 15 years or 20 years, um, now, especially with all the, you know, the, the massive digital panels and all the screens and everything else, you know, and being mostly kind of solid state stuff, are the companies going to be able to keep that going and, and maintain that? Or will there be, like you said, modules that go in and replace it with just a new and a better, a better version? Yeah. Well, I think there's a difference between the battery, you know, which is what everybody mm -hmm. tends to worry about. You know, what if I have a dead battery? It costs me 120 bucks to get a new phone battery. What's the car sure. equivalent? Um, versus they will decay and there will be parts problems at the same rate as any other car because everything yeah. has big screens. It's got everything has yeah. 22 electric motors or 122, et cetera. So I, the complexity of modern cars kind of scares me as someone who likes being able to open the hood and see ground on either side of my engine. Um, right. So, but electric cars will be part of that. But I think the battery thing, 
you know, if you have a weird, obscure cell maker, if the car was made in low volume, yeah, that will probably be a problem. Um, you know, and there are a variety of low volume electric cars out there. On the other hand, Volkswagen Eagles, they made it. Yeah. They made hundreds of thousands of them. Yeah. So, sure. you know, um, things like that, I think, especially if they have a major brand that's putting its foot down. I hope they're going to be smart enough to say we have to support these people. So let me ask you this. What do you have in your garage? What, what <laughs> cars do you currently own? Because obviously expert in the EV world, but what do you, what do you collect? What do you really enjoy to drive? Um, well, I have two of the cars my dad bought new when I was a kid. Um, I have the car I grew up sort of in the back of, which is a 1961 Morris Minor Woody Wagon. The last okay. legitimate production Woody in America. Yep. And I mean, everything past the B pillar is American yeah, ash wood. with aluminum hung off it. Yeah. Um, only in England. Supp they made 215,000 of them, I think. And supposedly lost money on every one for 18 years. <laughs> but um, I, I'm fond of it. It has only 54,000 really hard, painful, rusty miles but it is just coming back into my care after a COVID interrupted extra year on top okay. of doing the rest of the welding. Um, and that's, that's the one that sort of makes people grin. Um, okay. I also have my dad's 67 Sunbeam Alpine, which Very he cool. bought at, also new in London. We lived in mm -hmm. London a few times um, as an early midlife crisis car. He left us in the care of some folks and he and my mom went and toured Italy for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and that only has 38,000 miles on it, uh, never been driven in the salt. And um, it was a huge badge of honor when he handed it over to me before he died. And sure. I drove it to my garage and he fell asleep, which was an enormous relief <laughs> because it meant I wasn't doing anything awful. So those two, I have a 49 Morris Minor Tourer, a car that is so old, it had no turn signals. Um, okay. It's a particularly esoteric piece of Morris Minor history, which I will pass over uh, without mentioning. Mm -hmm. um, I have the 58 Riley 1.5 that I drove okay. in college. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, the Isuzu, which is my latest and sort of the fun car. And yep. I mean, I was shocked. I took it to Radwood, Boston. <laughs> that thing rocked and rolled. I, oh, I sure heard people coming up to me and, oh, well, I've always liked wagon backs. I, there's a story about renting two Geostorm wagon backs. Um, we took all the badges off one and asked people for a week, what was it? It was, we just, it was like an Avis rental. Yeah. And a friend of mine, probably Stone, got the idea. Let's debadge it and see if people know what it is. No one knew what it was. Everybody, right. Well, the people who did thought it was a sob. Um, so I've always liked two-door wagons. And I found a really nice one. Um, and people go wild. I was shocked. Oh, yeah. um, and then there's the daily, which is a, you know, lightly broken in 2000 Subaru Outback because the official vehicle of Woodstock, New York is the Subaru Outback. The Subaru Outback. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's very, only very got cool. 136,000 miles on it though. So I have some life left. But, yeah. That, well, that's the way that's where you, I felt about my Bronco, my Jeep. My Jeep's got 120 and my Bronco's got 105. And I'm like, oh, they easily have another 150,000 miles in either one of those, you yeah. know. So uh, that, that's very cool, John. So I, I one more question for you. Yeah. You have a lot of new companies. We've got Lucid. We've got Polestar that are coming into the, into the fray right now. Um, it seems that everybody is still touting the performance, right? And for, and I'm a performance car guy. I, I like, I, you know, have had drag cars and all this stuff. I'm, I'm literally have my 69 day home is going to get a, a thousand horsepower, you know, supercharged Hemi put in it soon. Is that still important? Because the average EV car right now, even a, a, a an e golf, is still very, very, very quick mm -hmm. to the point where 90% of the general population that gets in those cars are like, this is the fastest car I own because they are that much quicker than, you know, than petrol driven cars. I mean, they, they just are. Nobody can argue with that. Is that performance going to scale back a little bit? Because like you said, when we talk about like the Tesla Plaid that just came out and all this other stuff that goes zero to 60 in two seconds, do you think that's always going to be more of a parlor trick? Or do you think 
there, there's going to be a point where they just go, you know what? Let's just get back down to earth right now and, you know, make the normal EV go zero to 60 in five seconds or six seconds. Well, I don't think Volkswagen is selling its ID4 compact crossover on performance, aside from saying you'll be pleased how quick it is. Um, right. Ditto Nissan with the RN and so on. The, the Tesla Plaid is on one very far mm -hmm. end of the scale, but it did something, and the Model S really in the performance packs did something important, which was to take electric cars conclusively out of the fancy golf cart smelly hippie yep. end of things sure. and say, this is an amazingly blindingly fast car. And by the way, it's electric. The way I think performance translates is first range. Range is the new horsepower. But more than that, you quietly talk to people and even, even my mom, who has never really understood why electric gearbox, why uh, four speed gearboxes are there, you know, one, two, mm -hmm. three, four, stop, right. one, two, three, four. Um, but she likes stoplight Grand Prix acceleration as much as the next mm -hmm. person. And I think that is one of the reasons why electric cars, once they have enough range where people don't get nervous, and once people start understanding that you plug them in at night and forget about it otherwise, are better cars. People will start to understand that they're quieter, they're simpler. I get less road rage when I drive an EV. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I wanna see the first psychological study somewhere, somebody is doing it now. There's, there's a whole bunch of doctoral students somewhere. But um, people will start to appreciate when they can compare like to like, which will mm -hmm. happen five yep. years from now, that in fact, okay, I have this one where I never need to go to a gas station and it's smooth and it's quiet and I win at the stoplight or I have this one where I do have to go to the gas station, which has all these weird rising and falling noises and whines and, you mm -hmm. know, it, it sounds different at different speeds and I have to talk louder in it. And, um, oh, and that one is a third as much per mile. And the smart half of the couple says to the less smart half of the couple, you know, dear, I think that's a better vehicle, don't you? <laughs> well john you <laughs> this we're coming up on an hour so we're gonna clip oh, it i geez. think but Sorry. this has been oh yeah oh yeah it's, it's flown but huh? we absolutely have to have you back on soon because this is a thoroughly enjoyable conversation that i want to continue um for the simple fact that i think you know to your credit you're, you're able to dispel a lot of the myths and put it in, in in a way that people just really understand and i think that's one of the biggest hurdles to to kind of educating the general public. And like I said, myself included on, on EVs. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, uh, for me personally, it's always been about range. The fact mm -hmm. that it takes me X amount of time to, you know, charge. Like, I don't want to sit there and wait for 25 minutes or 30 minutes when I could fill the pump in seven minutes mm -hmm. or because, you know, whatever the case is. Um, but as the, the technology progresses, I think it will become just like everything else it'll be easier for people to understand. And, yeah. you know, kids that are, are being born today, who knows if they'll ever want a petrol driven vehicle. It might be an absolute novelty for them. They may, but in the same way that a 28 year old guy I know in my car club wants a Model T because it's so bizarrely Iron Age and primitive that he gets mm -hmm. off on being a guy who understands and has all the grandpas come up to him and, you know, tell him stories right um, i should close though by saying that two of the cars that i regret selling and eh, sort of regret selling are not electric um okay i got the down payment for my new york city apartment by selling my 64 goat convertible Oof. um they only made 6400 it was a california that, car mm. and utterly totally rust free and that's the advantage of being older than dirt i bought it for 1400 bucks Okay. Um, uh, but I would probably, I'd love to drive one again. If somebody out there in I can um, make hot rod barbecue world has a 64 go convertible, please let, I would love to drive that again I, because listen, it would probably scare the hell out of me. You, I, I have a great, a, a very a close friend of mine. That's local. If you come out to the Bay area, he has a 64 GTO tri-power car that I'm sure four speed car. I'm sure he'd let you jump behind the wheel of, um, be great. Might not be a drop top, but it might give you some, you know, similar feelings. Awesome. In, 
in that same oh what, so what's the other car what's the oh. other car that you sold so my brother um who worked in the fossil fuel business lived in oakland for a while when i was living out there and he had a 300 sel 6.3 and when he got shipped overseas i kept the car for a while and the fastest sedan in the world in 69 70 and 71 the big long wheelbase mercedes i forget the type number what an amazing car a little bit cumbersome around san francisco mm -hmm. but as smooth at 100 on the highway as it was at 50 and i just don't have enough money to afford the maintenance on a 300 sel 6.3 but i mm -hmm. still you know i see them come up on bring a trailer and i just look and i think oh man but well, he worked for an oil company and in 1991, you, so Mercedes will sell you anything, right? Oh, sure. A full exhaust system from the manifold back, mild steel, 1800 bucks. Yeah. So maybe that might be a driver too, or find a very wealthy. Driver. But anyway, <laughs> I still remember those cars out of the dozens and dozens that I've owned. So, um, well, John, thank you so much for coming on the barbecue. I promise we're yeah, going to have you back you. sooner rather than later because cool. it's, it's really been a wonderful conversation. And I think that, you know, for, for our readers and then those that listen, I mean, you know, we're all petrol driven. And I think EVs need to be a very integral part of the conversation going forward. So, sir, thank you. Thank you again. It's been a real treat. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening, folks. And again, please subscribe to the Hot Rod Barbecue podcast. If you're on Spotify, check us out there. Subscribe to it on iTunes. And if you are going to go to YouTube, make sure you go to the Hot Rod Barbecue podcast and uh, hit that subscribe button and we'll come to you every week.